So good evening, everybody, and you're most welcome, wherever you're joining us from this evening, um, to this, which is the 18th in the series of Let's Talk Equine. Um, my name is Wendy Conlon. I'm an equine specialist with Chagask, and I'm joined this evening by Warren Schofield of Lissadell Equine Hospital. Warren, you're, you're really welcome, and thank you for being with us this evening. You're really welcome, Wendy. So listen um, to everybody out there, I suppose first, as usual, I better do the little bit of housekeeping and that is to say that uh, this webinar is being recorded and we hope that technology obliging, um, fingers crossed in that direction, that we will be in a position to provide the recording in the next couple of days and that will be on www.chagas.ie forward slash let's talk equine for anybody who for one reason or another may become disconnected with internet coverage or anything like that don't don't fear we hope to to uh, give you give you the full recording afterwards so the other thing to mention is that of course we invite participants this evening to submit their questions and um, you can do that by hovering over the bottom of your screen and you will find the q a tab through which you can submit your, your questions to us this evening. And we'd be delighted to hear from you and very much encourage that to be done. So, um, like I say, delighted to be joined by Warren. Warren, you, you are based, um, you work out of Lissadell Equine Hospital, um, and that's in Navan and County Meath. And you've been in the veterinary profession for, well, a little while now. Um, <laughs> so you have a particular interest in orthopaedics, the relationship of lameness problems to equitation performance, behavioural issues, the overall welfare of the horse uh, is, is very much close to your heart. And um, you have, of course, a lot of experience in hospital medicine and surgery in relation to colic and gastrointestinal problems. We'll be speaking about colic this evening, but you also have experience around fertility and the care of pregnant mare and the foal from birth to adulthood. So a wide span, and I'm sure there's a lot of other aspects that are not mentioned in that little brief list, but it gives, it serves, it serves to, to I suppose, to, to offer a little bit of introduction. You might yourself, Warren, just Thank give you. us a little bit of, um, a little bit of an insight into, I suppose, you know, what the day job involves for you and, um, you know, a little bit of an intro before we get into the meat and bones of this evening. Great. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction, Wendy. And yes, yeah, so I've been an equine surgeon in Ireland for the last uh, 28 years. And uh, uh, when I when I came over to Ireland, um, uh, having done a few years of practice in England, I, I joined the team at University College Dublin um, as a resident, and I spent six and a half years there and uh, trained as a specialist surgeon in, in cattle as well as horses, actually. Um, and then I, I joined uh, the team at uh, Tritown Equine Hospital, where I spent 20 years and uh, doing a lot of a lot of colic surgery and it's where I got a passion for, for, for colic surgery and for treating horses with colic not just uh, surgically but medically um, and improving the ways we could treat them within the hospital so you know I, I'm really excited about this webinar tonight because I, I, I hope I can impart some knowledge and share some tips on how we can prevent colic um, uh, and what we know about it um, to help people's understanding because um, uh, hopefully you've got some really interested listeners and um, currently um, I, I, I left uh, Troytown Hospital a few years ago and I'm operating as an independent uh, surgeon consultant and I, I work mainly out of Lissadell Equine Hospital in Navan um, and we've had a bit of a long day some of my team might be on that might be listening uh, there but unfortunately our last patient has just recovered so that's really good um, so um, that's the uh, best so, news really isn't it to have at the end of a day it, it is it is a great relief because i had to leave the hospital um, unfortunately while my patient was still uh, partially asleep so i could get to this webinar believe it or not <laughs> which is yeah. not the usual modus operandi we are very fortunate um, to have you here warren and we're 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 delighted at the same time too i, I i'm going to start a screen share here um just so you can uh, just brilliant. check in with me that you can see it sorry my mouse is not moving for me here now um, you just just let me know that you I can, can see actually that. see good. that. Yeah, perfect. Super. 
So, um, yeah, so are there, are there any other remarks that you would like to make before we kick into this? Yeah, I, I suppose, you know, I, I've got uh, 20 odd slides prepared to give a bit of a structure to the talk. But I think really if anybody's got any questions um, uh, to, to use the question and answer box and, you know, if I, I can either take them at the end or I can take them partway through Wendy. Um, and Wendy, it was quite funny when you said you were gonna you were gonna take care of the housekeeping. I thought you were gonna start showing us where the emergency exits were. Actually, I thought that was gonna be quite funny. Um, but anyway, sorry. I'm... Mine is stage left or stage right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so look, without further ado, let's crack on with the main talk, and then hopefully we can take questions. And I'm, I'm sure people might have specific questions, and I'll try and answer them as best I possibly can. Okay. okay. Um, so, so look, this is this is an overview of the content of my of the talk. So, um, hopefully, we'll cover all of these questions. Um, you know, what is colic? Why is it so important? And um, you know, what are the signs? What are the causes? And what have we worked out of, of what we call risk factors over the last twenty or thirty years in regards to colic? And then we'll discuss first line of care. I might show you a dramatic uh, couple of cases, um, and then we can discuss in detail sort of like how we can minimize colic occurrence okay are you am i i can't control the slides wendy so you're controlling them for me are you yeah you just give me a prompt okay. and you want me to move okay. on brilliant so let's go to the next slide so first of all let's let's be straight about these things what is colic okay um basically colic refers to any kind of um abdominal pain but in terms of you know the horses don't you know have trouble sort of working out sometimes whether they've got pain in their abdomen or pain in their chest so chest pain can cause colic signs as well and the if you look at the two pictures at the bottom uh the first of all the, the picture that on the left the, the with the pink goat yeah that one um oh i can produce i don't know if that people can see it when i do it though so so this uh, this is a this is a foal actually with meconium impaction and and this little foal is colicking because his his intestines have become blocked and then they've become distended with gas and the the gas distension is producing a tightness and a, a tension and a filling which he's represent is, is showing as pain okay so um and then on the on the, the the picture on the right with the black intestine is showing this pain is dead and uh, sorry this this intestine is dead and there might actually be no more pain from that at that stage um so you know it's it's, it's distended intestine causes the colic in most instances and that fits in with what we know um colic is a, is a i know is a very scary thing for horse owners and horse carers and i'll give you some statistics on that to show why it is something that is a, is genuinely scary but you know what we should remember is 80 to 90 percent of colic cases are relatively simple in the horse okay and they um uh they um they pass relatively quickly um sometimes without any medicines or sometimes with just one shot of medicine so we call those spasmodic colics okay and it's really only the minority of cases that go on to require anything more than simple treatment and it's thought really on the statistics you know, maybe about one in 20 horses uh, require surgery, somewhere around about 5%. Okay, pass on to the next slide. But, but yet, albeit that, that's only, that that is, you know, a smaller minority, I suppose it, it's still really, it's really significant when that happens. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And one of the slides later on showing the the epidemiology will show that as well why it is something that is a genuine concern yeah so so why is it important um unfortunately these this is true it is the biggest killer of adult horses um and i can i can 
understand people's concerns about it because it it seems to strike indiscriminately at times you know it's unpredictable and you know it can kill horses in a matter of hours you know so the black intestine we can see on the picture um in surgery there you know that that's a piece of intestine that's had its blood supply cut off because of a twist um and you know that that bowel has died and then the bowel on the other bit of the picture is in, in the in the in the in, in the stages of progressing to dying so these changes can happen in a matter of a couple of hours and of course for a lot of our audience there's a higher incidence in in breeding animals um and that's because brood mares they brood mares can get uterine problems um, which all present as colic and we, we categorize together. So it may not be just intestinal problems, but, um, you know, uterine displacements or twists um, and sometimes bleeding from the, um, from the ovarian uh, arteries, which is a common problem in older brood mares just after they've had their falls, you know, a, call uh, what we call colic and they they cause colic signs um so economically it is very very important um especially in brood mess. stallions stallions for example can suffer types of colic that geldings and brood mess exceptionally rarely suffer from for example you know um a herniation of their intestines into their scrotums um, and that then can have a subsequent you know even though that can be surgically treated it could have a fertility problem knock-on effect as well so it is important it's a very important disease um, and why we you know we we consider it as so um and, we, and so why so much research is done into it and like obviously as you say i mean you know the economics are there the economics are there in the sense of the loss of the the animal potentially but there's also the economics even if you have the survival of the animal where you have these severe cases that end up in surgery because obviously surgery comes at a cost yeah surgery comes at a cost um and um you know but i mean surgery has advanced in the last 20 or 30 years and uh, a lot more can be done now but obviously, it it um, you know the, the you know a lot of your our listeners will uh, be aware of the 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 economic the the veterinary fees that that it can um, generate. Yes, for, so for somebody it, who who has been lucky or fortunate enough not to have been in the position of having to 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 go through that experience, can you give? Can you give people a little bit of an, an insight into you know what the costs are that that, that could be involved in, in that kind of a scenario? Yeah, I mean, you know, simple treatment can be anywhere from less than 100 euros to a few hundred euros. Um, but if, you know, for that one in 20 that requires colic surgery, um, surgery fees can be in the region of 4,000 to 5,000 euros, um, and, you know, to cover the cost of surgery and anesthesia and then recovery and usually, you know, four, five, six, seven days in the hospital after surgery as well. Um, but, you know, and, and, you know, there is a, there is one myth that I would like to tackle. And that is that some people say that, that, that after a horse has had colic surgery it's never the same again and, and, and I don't think that's the case you know um, you know um, so you know loads of horses have colic surgery and then very successfully go back to uh, top level performance or back to to breeding and um, so they can be really very very good um, but you know and we're going to talk about it later on when we look at the 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 the, the number of horses that colic um, you know once a horse has had surgery then there's an increased risk of that horse from uh, suffering from further bouts of colic in subsequent years as well wendy yeah, yeah. so I'll, I'll move along for you there warren so you know the clinical signs i mean lots of people know these but i just wanted to to to, to stress some some interesting points you know so the classic thing the classic colic signs um, pawing, rolling, lying down, you know, uh, flank watching either when they're standing up or when they're lying down, getting sweated or agitated, and sometimes just standing still or, or not moving, um, and sometimes stretching out with their front legs in front, um, as you can see in the middle 
little picture there, that horse is actually suffering from pain in the, the sort of anterior abdomen, the front part of the abdomen. And that's one of the few signs with, that's sometimes characteristic because what we say about a lot of the signs is they're not specific for any particular type of colic. Um, so, you know, just because a horse is, 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 is doing something, you, it, it's, it's not, it's not, useful for a vet to say well just because it's showing that particular aspect say it's rolling on its back and staying with its feet in the air it doesn't mean it to say it's any particular type of colic whereas lots of people seem to think that you know particular signs might indicate a particular type of colic i don't think that's true and really what i say is basically doing anything un unusual and out of the ordinary can be a sign of colic and i remember going back if i go back um, when i was an ambulatory vet in the uk before i came to ireland um, and one of the patients i um i, I dealt with was um a, a sport horse and uh, she was in the paddock and she was standing with her feet in the water trough um, but the owner knew that this was very unusual so i went to i went to see her that evening and you know we she wasn't too bad her pulse wasn't elevated and she was she was she was she was okay i gave her a shot of painkillers um, but she, the next day she was still doing exactly the same. So I went back out the following morning and at that stage she had actually deteriorated and I had to refer her down to Newmarket um, and she did subsequently have surgery and she had to have 20 feet of small intestine removed. And, and the owner swears that that, that, that that mare, she never rolled, she never lay down. But what she did do, she just stood with her front feet in the water trough uh, for a, a sort of like, you know, for, for sort of like half a day um, until she was sent down to the hospital where, you know, they realized that they had to do surgery, you know? So, you know, like I said, most signs of colic, they're not specific for a particular type of colic, um, and, you know, but except maybe that sometimes when they stand with their front legs stretched out in front like that. But then we'd still do a whole range of tests in a hospital to find out exactly what is wrong. But really, like I said, if a horse, if you know your horses, as, as a lot of uh, listeners will do, you know, if they're doing anything that's unusual, then it could mean, you know, a, a abdominal pain and colic, you know. And I suppose that is the thing like that to emphasize really is is for horse and pony owners out there to really know their animals and be be acutely aware of what is normal to each individual and each is an individual at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And and, um, and, and you know, I suppose little things as well, too, but like paying attention, I guess, to, you know, the amount of droppings and things like that in the stable, you know, like, you know, being observant and, and not sort of dismissing things too quickly is, is important as well. Yeah, that, that's right. You know, the, the not passing droppings, um, you know, I mean, you know, we all know a, a horse should normally pass, uh, you know, about uh, four to eight droppings over a full day. And if, if that stops for some reason, then, you know, if that stops for more than 12, 24 hours, then you, you want to be on top of it. Um, and, um, you know, again, not eating, you know, can be a sign of colic as well. So, so all of these things, if you know, you know, if you know your horse and you know something isn't right, um, uh, then you're probably right. And go follow your gut reactions. And, uh, you know, I would, I would usually seek veterinary attention. That's what I would advise, you know. And just as a matter of interest, when you mentioned, you know, the pulse rate of the, of the other individual um, in, in Newmarket, how relevant is it, in your opinion, to, to keep an eye on, on the vital signs like temperature, pulse, etc.? Um, when, 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 you know, when one has concerns about, about an individual. Yeah, no, it, it, very good point, Wendy. You know, I, I, I was, I wasn't going to stray too much into the veterinary stuff of it, uh, but, um, you know, the veterinary aspects, but, and, uh, you know, a persistently elevated pulse is an indication um, that, you know, that the changes are happening that are of concern. Um, now, what we know in the experiments that are done, that, that when a horse is actually colicking, the pulse rate is going to go back up, it's going to go up. But then when they sort of like pause and stop their colic signs, then the pulse rate goes back down. And that's a sign that, 
you know, that's, that's a good sign. But if they, you know, the pulse rate goes up when they're colicking and then doesn't come back down, then that is a, definitely a cause of concern, you know? Um, so, um, and, and again, temperature as well, you know? Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So let's move it on me again. Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. So, um, so what are the causes of colic? Um, and really we need to get in, we need to differentiate here a cause of colic from a, a type of colic, okay? Um, and a type of colic is, for example, like the, the spasmodic colic. Okay, so that's a, a type of colic and then there's an impaction, that's another type of colic. And those are the two of our commonest types of colic. Um, so as I said before, spasmodic colic, I've put there on the side about 80, 85%. Um, and impactions 10%, one in 10 horses, um, one in 10 episodes of colic in Ireland is um, caused by an impaction. Okay, so so those are the types of colic, and then we're going to go into the to the causes. And each different type of colic has a potentially a different cause as well. So it's very important we sort of like uh, just sort of like consider that and differentiate that. And again, like I'm saying there, you know, five percent or one case in twenty is a severe. Um, type of colic which either you know necessitates surgery or treatment in a hospital for example a horse with you know horses with which which develop um, a colitis or a scour or a diarrhea often can be quite painful as well and the and the first sign I uh, we would we would uh, recognize commonly is that a horse would would start showing signs of, of colic and they can, can be quite severe as well and then they go into the hospital and then they've started scouring as well so it's the, the, often the colic precedes the diarrhea or the scour as well. So, like I said, different types of colic. There's and and and, and there are hundreds of different types of colic. Okay. Um, so impactions. You know, I'm just going to talk about impactions for a minute or two. And you can see on the pictures on the right there, um, and um, the two pictures in surgery. Um, you can see. Uh, the the first of all the the, the top picture um, we we've made an incision into the intest intestine there to empty out the contents of what is the large colon so you know you got to remember horses are phenomenally good um, at getting the best out of very poor grass and very poor nutrition in fact from an evolutionary perspective. The, the the intestines of a horse are actually more efficient at converting air, the uh, converting energy from roughage into muscle mass and energy for them than cattle. So you know they're an incredibly highly evolved intestines, and so these two top pictures are pictures of large intestine, and the the, the flexure at the bottom where we've made the incision, um, and where the food is coming out. That is uh, where, the, where the ingester is coming out, um, where we're emptying it from, is what we call the pelvic flexure. Okay, and that is where the vast majority of impactions actually occur. So, and the good thing about this is they can be palpated on a rectal examination. So, uh, veterinary surgeons will will feel that and they'll diagnose it. And I'm sure very most of the listeners will be familiar with that they, have had horses with impactions. So that's where the impaction most likely happens. And that uh, large colon is about uh, about six feet long and is where the um, where the, the food um, material um, is fermented. So the other thing that makes the horses so efficient is that they've got a massively long small intestine. So they have actually approximately an adult um, full grown thoroughbred or sport horse will have about 50 feet of small intestine, whereas humans only have about 24, 25 feet. So our horses have twice as much a length of small intestine and that makes them very, very efficient. But the problem is it makes them predisposed to having twists and displacements, which are all of these different types of colic. OK, and a lot of times we can, you know, we can talk about about the, the cause, you know, anything that can upset that, um, 
that um, you know that that um, balance in their intestines. And, and at the moment, we actually don't know much about the what we're calling the microbiota of the large colons and, and a massive amount of that is going into research in humans isn't it as well uh, because we we actually we haven't classified every single bacteria that is commonly present in human intestines so we certainly haven't done it for horses yet either so so that's the large colon where you know a lot of the fermentation occurs and so impactions the, the big risk for the big cause of impaction is a horse that um, has been exercised um, and is has been access to grass is then comes in and stops exercising maybe it gets a, a, a lameness problem which is very very common um, in the horses and they get rested in the stable and they start eating hay and they just eat way too much and they don't drink enough um, and you know if they're left without water for any time then that will make de definitely predispose to it and they will get an impaction and the good thing about impactions most of the time they'll be treated successfully and and you know um so i put a i put a, a picture there of droppings at the bottom so you know because i you know when i'm investigating an individual case of colic i will be really interested to find out exactly what the nature of the droppings um are now look i'm not fastidious about it like some people are but it'd be useful to know a little bit you know are they are they dry and and firm in particular because that would be indicative of, a, of an impaction so again uh people will know the the nature of their horses droppings and and you know it's something again we we don't know a massive amount about for example you know horses that experience experience stress may get very loose droppings at times and people may recognize that may be associated with transportation um, and things so you know um, and then it may solidify um, and, and become more normal again as the stress recedes but you know in a way anything that can affect the the, the microbiota of the horse's intestine can potentially predispose to colic um, and on the um on, on the bottom then in the surgical picture you know uh, an, another example of a yeah there we go that you're, you're pointing out perfectly wendy another example of a sort of like a a, a severe um colic a surgical colic that's a hole in the um the, the 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 mesentery of the small intestine so so those loops are you can see they're much smaller than these bigger loops that we can see on the other pictures um, but that's part of the 50 feet of small intestine which makes the horse so amazingly efficient in their digestive processes but unfortunately there's a hole developed in that mesentery and then that hole can act as a focus through which the small intestine the big hole the small intestine can go and get trapped in there and then twist around so um you know we can we you know a, a, a rent or a hole that can develop in that curtain that wouldn't, wouldn't normally be there and that curtain is there supplies the intestines with the blood supply okay and so sometimes that rent can be really big and damage the intestine um just by damaging the blood supply but mostly it will act as a, a focus of a twist and then that's when surgical treatment is is required so you know very important to distinguish different types of colics like i said hundreds of different types um but it, you know um the simple types the the impactions and then loads of different types of surgical cases okay quite something when you see it laid out on the table like that you're you're you you're used to that vision but it's quite something to see it laid out on the table in that manner yeah. I know. So some of my friends, if, um, friends were asking if there was going to be a lot of blood and guts. I said there's definitely going to be a lot of guts. <laughs> okay. Um, just just a, a call out to anybody who's newly joined us as well. That that a reminder that they can can submit questions to us via the Q and A tab as we go along as well. So will, will I move along? Yeah. Perfect. So we're looking. So we're looking at the again causes of colic now. Um, and like I said. The, the changes in the microbiota um, are going to be a, a real significant thing that can predispose horses to colic. Okay, um, so you know dietary related um, causes of colic are the most uh, common, and basically any changes in the diet could kind of precipitate an episode of colic, and certainly 
you know, the big, one of the big things is spoiled food substances. Whenever um, I've been involved over the last 20 years in, you know, outbreaks where um, there've been more than, uh, more than one horse has had a, a, an episode of colic within a very short time period of, on, a, on a premises, then I, the most important thing to look for is spoiled food substances. So is there any of the forage spoiled? Is there any of the hard food, coarse food uh, spoiled? Um, you know, the haylage or the hay? Um, and, and what has changed? Because those will cause outbreaks of colic and um, i've been involved in a number of situations and then obviously what happens is i mean that's common sense lots of people then find it they throw the food stuff out and it usually knocks it on the head and it, it stops it but you know if you are dealing if you are looking after hundreds of horses and there's more than you know there's, there's, there's more than one of them colicking then i would be immediately in the feed room examining very very detailed the the, the food substances uh, because that is just so important um, you know um, I'm going to talk about the increased risk of, of, of colic when we with with increased amounts of concentrates um, later on but you know as the in generally speaking the more concentrates of a horse is fed then the more likely um, is the, the the horse may suffer an episode of colic Okay, and um, uh, and 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 the and then the 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 opposite of that is true as well, Wendy. So um, grass is a known protective effect against getting colic, and I've got some statistics for that coming up later on, just to to show people. But you know, basically, a horse that is out on grass is much less likely to suffer colic uh, than horses that are in stables and getting large amounts of concentrates, okay? Um, and like I said, we, we talked about impactions there and, and, and loss of access to water if there's a, if there's a problem you know, for example, in the wintertime, if the, if the water gets iced up or if people, um, you know, uh, the, if there's some, some, some error and, and, you know, the horses don't get water in the stables, then, you know, they will uh, potentially suffer from impactions, you know. And if we look at the younger horses, then, you know, obviously parasites, you've got a, you've got a beautiful picture there, but it's not beautiful. There's, there's hundreds of, uh, of, uh, of parasites there, and those are ascarids. Um, big worms about 10 centimeters long um, and they can block off um, a foal's uh, intestines like that. Uh, so very important to, to talk about worming and we'll, we'll do that later. Uh, younger horses again are, are prone to getting um, uh, what we call intersusceptions and this is where one piece of intestine telescopes into another if I can show it sort of like telescopes in and then gets trapped um, and th that's sometimes related to in young horses to them getting diarrhea and colitis and scour so you know younger horses have those kind of uh, can suffer from those kinds of colics older horses can suffer from colics such as lipomas and at the bottom picture here is a sort of like a what we call a lipoma it's it's a, it's a fatty mass attached to the the mesentery of the intestine but when they get above a certain size and you can see that one that one if you can see the size of the hand there in the picture is about the size of, of a fist um, probably weighing about you know uh, seven or eight nine ten ounces or something like that and again that can act as a focus to cause a twist and so those lipomas are much more likely to cause colic in older horses and particularly horses that are, are overweight as well so um so 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 though you know so as you get uh, you know so there's different risk factors for younger horses and older horses now parasites that th there's a complicated relationship really between parasites and colic in horses and we're going to talk about it a bit later but one of the important uh, parasites is tapeworms and i've got a horse that suffered from tapeworm colic we had a blockage of its intestine and i had to have a bypass because of it um so you know we will be going into a lot of detail but it just while it's fresh in my mind i'm going to say you know we should be treating for tapeworms in the um in the springtime and in the autumn time and one of my colleagues ursula fogarty the irish equine center i don't know if ursula is watching but if you are hi i said i'd say hello and wave there um and she did a study in the um 
in the 1980s and 1990s about the prevalence of tapeworms in Irish horses. And she found that 50% uh, of horses uh, that went into the abattoir had tapeworms. Now, I realize that that may be not representative of the most best looked after horses, and some of them had very small amounts of tapeworms, but um, tapeworms attach at the junction between the small intestine and the large intestine, and they can cause dysfunction there. And um, so, so tapeworms, treatment for tapeworms is very important. Tapeworms are widespread, and they're harder to diagnose, harder to diagnose them uh, than the other forms of uh, parasites. Um, so, uh, so important to, uh, to, to consider tapeworms as well in our worming programs, really important. And again, we, we will cover more of that in detail later. And then, fortunately, horses are usually uh, very careful about what they eat, Wendy. Um, you know, they're not as, uh, uh, you know, they're not as, um, as, as daft as dogs when it comes to eating things that they shouldn't eat, you know. Um, but I have seen colics associated with foreign bodies, such as plastics, um, silage wraps. Um, I've seen horses chew on electric fence tape and ingest those, and they've caused colic problems as well. Now, they'd be fair, relatively rare, but certainly young horses um, that um, young horses, you know, can develop a, a taste for those things and just, you know, chew on them. Maybe they're bored as well. Um, and again, they will cause um, blockages. Um, sand colic um, happens on sandy pasture when the horses maybe haven't got enough grasses and, and they graze right down to the roots of the grass and they take in some sand. And also you've got to be careful with, with sand. You know, if you're feeling, feeding hay and many people may have just taken their, their horses off their, their land to preserve it in this last week of bad weather um, and they may be sort of giving their horses time out in, the, in, the, in, in a sand arena. Um, you know, the, the, recommend, the current recommendation is that you feed the, the hay or the forage um, off the sand. Um, so sometimes putting a, um, a sort of like a sheet on the ground so that the, the horses are not ingesting too much sand. Because I have seen sand colic in England and Ireland as well, uh, although it's much more common in, in, in dry places and uh, places like uh, in the desert. But a lot of the times we're not going to be able to work out the precise cause of the colic. OK, so most of the time, you know, um, we're not going to know a precise cause in every single case, especially when we talk about the entrapments and the twists and some of the internal internal herniations um, that we're going to talk about um, as well. So we don't know what will have caused those. And I know that that, that can be frustrating to people, um, but I say it a lot and I think it's something that's important in healthcare. We should we should admit what we don't know um, as much as what we do know. Um, and it's great sometimes if we can find a precise cause. Um, um, and here we go. We've got, um, we've got a couple of questions. I might just deal with them. Now, first of all, from Sasha, um, horses gorging on crap apples when the grass is in short supply equals cider belly and being a bit drunk as they start to ferment in the gut. Okay, uh, that's really interesting. I, I've not actually come across that, I'm going to be really honest. So do they become a little bit drunk? Um, I'd have thought that they would have metabolized the alcohol pretty quickly, actually, Sasha. So I, I've, I've actually don't think I've ever come across that in a book either. So um, if, if that happens, I'd be really fascinated. Maybe you could take a little video there of the, the horse while it's a little bit uh, wobbly from the drunkenness. Um, and then Anne Scott. Anne Scott is a, a practitioner up in Donegal, if it's the same Anne Scott, um, is it? But anyway, maybe she'll confirm that for me. Um, have you found melanomas to be a cause of significant colon in older greys? Um, so certainly um, there is a, a syndrome um, and in older horses where uh, melanomas can cause a colic and sometimes it can be very, very severe. Um, and, you know, we don't understand melanoma biology tremendously well. So melanomas are the, are the tumors that happen in gray horses and um, 
their growth is very unpredictable. Um, but unfortunately, if they do grow in critical locations, for example, I've seen a number of, of chest melanomas that have grown um, very close to the heart and then damage the heart. Um, and they, they result in colic and usually very severe colic. And it usually results in the demise of the patient because it's virtually impossible to remove them. Um, but it is interesting. I've, I've very, I don't think I've, I, I, I've, I've rarely seen melanomas um, in, in, in uh, causing colics in the abdomen. So, so yes, it does happen, but it's fortunately fairly rare. And consider, when we consider the, um, uh, the amount of gray horses, I think statistically speaking, you know, the melanomas causing colic is not a, a massive contributor to that. Um, I, that. That's a long way of answering it, isn't it? Um, we might leave. We might leave the, the the parasite question until we come back to that at the Perfect. end. Perfect. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Shirley, Shirley Jones, we can see your very good we'll, question. We'll come back to us. We'll, we'll and come it is Anne Scott there. Anne Scott yeah. there is. I was. Uh, uh, Anne Scott there is on the is a veterinary surgeon. She's yeah. sneaking in there from Donegal. <laughs> uh, a very good practitioner up on the. Um, we'll we'll push on another bit, Warren. Down. So we will just to get get yeah, get the maximum on, benefit on. from you this evening. So. Um, <laughs> Just stepping back a moment, just in relation yeah. to diet and, you know, that sort of side of things as well. I suppose it is worth emphasizing also, you know, to take care, I guess, in, in making transitions in diet and to do those kind of things gradually and not in one yes. foul swoop. Like emphasizing the small things in this regard can mean an awful lot. And, you know, I suppose yeah. the other thing maybe that I would would emphasize as well is that, you know, you can get your forage tested. You should get your forage tested to see its quality and so forth before you start feeding new batches and make transitions between batches gradually as well would, would be yes. um, something that, that, that I suppose I, I would, would, um, would, would suggest. Would you agree on that front? I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and what is probably, and, and I, I'm going to emphasize the spoiled food substances as well. At this time of year, haylage, for example, that's getting about six months of age now. Um, and that's when, you know, problems with preservation, you know, the, the you know, damage to the outer wrapping can re in, you know, result in spoilage and things like that. So, you know, so gradual, gradual changes in diet, very important, as you said, Wendy. And as much as that forage can be great when you bring it in first and have it tested first, I mean, you need to keep an eye on how it's stored and, you know, maybe even consider interval testing along the way because, um, you know, the quality and the way in which, which it's stored is also important as well. And I just wanted also to, to, to just, just um, in relation to the, the, um, the, the status of the teeth, and just to get your opinion on that and, and, it's, and it's, its potential impact as well, you know, impact on colics and so forth. Absolutely. I mean, I mean it, it's a very good question. Um, and again, it, it's something that's in the textbooks, um, always saying that the teeth problems can be a cause of colic, Wendy. But again, when we, when we look at some of my later slides as we go on, you know, the teeth doesn't come up as a consistent cause of colic so i'm gonna say that it's a you know it, it's it's a lesser problem than some of the other things you know mm -hmm. um to be honest you know because it's amazing how they'll cope to be honest you know mm -hmm. so these are some important statistics and these are a bit scary guys okay and these will back up why people are concerned about colic um you know if we look at the average number of cases happening because sometimes i'm asked to look at a um a, 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 a premises that has got a problem they, they perceive they've got a, a high incidence of colic but when we calculate the number of um colic incidences per horse year it seems to be pretty average and you know basically four to ten cases of colic per 100 horse years. So basically, if you have, um, you know, three or four, say three or four horses, um, and they live out their entire life from birth to, to, to their late 20s with you, you know, you're going to have over those, um, you know, those four years with them, you're going to have one to two or three cases of colic, you know. Um, so, you know, it's important to know that figure so that you can, you can look and if you, if you are experiencing 
experiencing more than that, uh, then you know maybe there is a problem. But to be also taken into consideration is this is this repeat colic. So some horses. Um, you know, and they may be the horses that have pre had previous surgery, um, but they may be may have never had surgery. Some horses do regularly have two to four episodes of colic a year. Now, I always say you've still got to treat each episode as a potential significant serious problem. Although, obviously, you know, again, if it if it's if it's the same type of colic and it's showing the same signs and it it, it dissipates with the same treatment, then you know you don't need to be in investigating everyone all you know in depth all the time so some horses so if you have one or two of those horses and um, then they could skew your statistic and make it look as though you've got a lot of colic on the whole premises but that may not be the case um, and then the death rate generally um, sort of like 0.7 so less than one horse uh, per 100 horse years okay um, uh, but the last figure is a bit scary, okay? So the all, overall death rate is 6.7%. And this is a, from a massive study. So basically, it means that if a horse starts an episode of colic, then it's one in 14 chance of actually dying from that colic episode. Um, and, you know, some of the examples of, of death, um, you know, are, are given there if it's stomach ruptures because of an obstruction or, or something like that. That is something that, that I would like people to remember uh, and take home that, you know, we should never be blasé about colic and I, I don't think most breeders are and i thought most people are, aren't but you know uh, you know every time a horse has a colic episode that it's got a one in 14 chance of dying and therefore we should take it very very seriously you know um and that is a little bit scary and again there's an indiscriminate as to that it's it's unpredictable and that's what genuinely makes it of concern you know We move so, on then. I'm just watching yeah. the talk as well too. Yeah. Yeah. No, you've you've um, you've, you've you've sidetracked me, Wendy, a few times. <laughs> um, Go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know what. Uh, you know, the initial treatment um, is uh, is uh, something I just wanted to cover and talk about. Um, you know. Uh, you know, how long before you seek veterinary advice? I think it depends on, how, on, on, you know, again, you know your horse. And again, if you categorize the colic as, as what, I, what I always say to people, is it mild, is it, is it moderate, or is it severe? You know, if it's moderate or severe, you're more likely to get veterinary attention immediately. But if it's a mild form of colic and the horse is, is just pawing and maybe just lies down and isn't rolling or anything like that, then, you know, you might just take the horse out for a walk um and um you know i've always found walking and exercise does not do any harm i can think of no incident in my 25 years where walking has done any harm whatsoever some some of the trainers in this country are quite renowned they, they would be happy to um to, to saddle up a horse and send them for a little exercise up the gallops as well and again i don't think that does any harm if there's harm already done then it's not going to resolve it but in some of the cases of the large colons and the displacements it, it possibly works so walking exercise I, i'm very happy with i i like people to remove the feet okay so if if a horse has had um an episode of colic and then it seems to have got a little bit better i would like them to walk it around for 30 or 40 minutes um, um and you know not to then you know to carry on feeding it you know take away the feed take away the hay and just let the intestines let the let the stomach rest for for an hour or two before you put the food back in i think that's no harm whatsoever and sometimes with a mild episode of colic you know you might not see seek veterinary rice for 15 or 20 minutes and I'm fairly relaxed about that. But obviously that's on the, in those mild cases, you know, that are not progressing. And again, lunging exercise, I have no problem with that. And certainly there, there are scientific papers where, you know, uh, horses have gone into hospitals and they've got some types of colic, which where they, they think that exercising may budge a displacement. It probably isn't going to undo a, a full twist, um, but, you know, uh, the lunging exercise, Exercise again, it usually does no harm whatsoever. Um, so, uh, you know, for those mild colics, it may well, you know, because remember some of these colics are going to be gas, they're gassy. 
spasmodic colics, and a little bit of exercise may help the gas to move along. So usually does no harm in moderation whatsoever, you know? When are you getting to the point of agitation in terms of the signs that look an actual transportation to hospital to Lissadell or wherever may be on the cards? Yeah, you know, um, uh, so, you know, that, that really is to be discussed by your veterinary surgeon, I feel, um, you know, and, um, you know, the veterinary surgeon is going to examine the horse and, you know, if he's immediately concerned, he's going to maybe advise referral. Um, a lot of time, you know, one of the, one of the most useful things from a veterinary aspect is actually response to treatment. So giving a painkiller or, or, or an anti-inflammatory, and I think those are on the next slide, Wendy, you know, um, you know, and if there's a good response to treatment and so the very commonly used drugs the you know the painkillers um, things like buscopan people will be familiar with um, and the anti-inflammatories um, and the sedatives you know they're all you know very useful to resolve those those mild forms of colic and they might work on the more severe forms of colic but then what will happen usually is that um, you know, if it is a more severe type of colic, then the colic signs will come back. And then obviously that's, that's, that's when I, I always say to people, well, that shows that there's some, a more persistent problem. Okay. So if you remember 80 to 90% of your colleagues, if they get better with one injection, you don't need to worry about them. Thank heavens for that. And there's a, a great deal of relief. But if, you know, if they have some immediate treatment, and then the signs persist, that's when, um, you know, to, to, to look into it in more detail. Um, and, you know, veterinary surgeons may do stomach tubing at the first occasion, and there are differences in jurisdiction and difference in practices. And I'm not going to get into the rights of wrongs of, of people do, administering injections themselves, um, and different practices may be different and different um uh, you know clients may be comfortable injecting their own horses but that's that's a an in-depth an in-depth dialogue with their own veterinary surgeon really you know um flick on to the next slide i think because there's yeah so so just to mention about this you know so rectal examination and stomach tubing uh, uh you know the, the veterinary surgeons um frequently do these in the field I wanted to just really talk about the safety aspects of it, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, um, you can see I'm doing a, a rectal examination there on the left, um, uh, and Sarah's doing one there on the right, and we're, we're, in, we're in stocks and we've got, you know, great facilities in the hospital. Um, but even so, we will often use sedatives just to, for the safety, not only of, the, of ourselves, but also for the horse as well. Uh, because, you know, any um, horse that's not used to having a rectal examination, you know, could potentially get a rectal tear. So therefore, giving a sedative, if your veterinary surgeon wants to give a sedative, then I'd be, I'd be very sort of like happy and, and, and obliging because, you know, uh, stomach tubing and rectal examination you know, they do carry a bit of risk for our horses. And, um, you know, it, it, it's no harm to give a little bit of sedative. The sedatives are generally relatively short acting. So, because um, most of the sedatives do have a pain killing effect as well. Um, but, you know, like I said, because they're short acting, they last for no more than half an hour, an hour, or maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, and then their effects are gone. So, um, so, you know, if a horse is given one of these sedatives and then is still colicking, that's actually a sign of a persistent problem. So it's actually a very useful thing as well, you know, but the, the safety aspects, especially in the field, um, for the horse handlers as well, really, really important, you know? Okay. Can I hear you, Wendy? Yeah, great. So actually this is my first yeah, this is the, a dramatic case. So the next, we'll go through the next slide. So this is a, a horse that did have to go uh, to surgery. And you can see me, I look a bit more, very more youthful there on the left um, hand side. Um, and if I remember rightly, this was an, a, an adult horse. Um, it was um, a, a mare and, and she was about 12 years of age. And she had been given some painkillers at home and uh, the, the signs of colic had gone away to start with, but then they had come back and her veterinary surgeon then advised her to come into the hospital. So um, she uh, came in and we did scans of the abdomen and we could see there were lots of small intestine uh, collecting in the abdomen, which indicated a blockage, you know, because it's, 
it, you know, in, in a way it's simple plumbing, you know, uh, what goes in at the front has got to come out the back in a digested form. And if it's, if it blocks somewhere along the way, then that's when the signs of colic will occur. And sometimes you might need a surgeon uh, to resolve it. So anyway, I'm, I, I, you know, we're pulling out of the intestine, all of this distended, discolored bowel. And you can see it's a little bit, um, a little bit blood, stained a little bit congested we would say and and what's actually happened here is the small intestine and remember there's 50 feet of the small intestine some of it has got tra trapped in a in what we used to, what we called the the epiploic foramen and this is a a very small hole it's about a little slit like that and what happens is the small intestine can get through the little slit like that and then it can all get in there the slit will open up but then as the as the, the intestines go through, the, the, the blood supply will be blocked off. And then because it's only gets larger, it can't come back out. So it gets stuck and then the blood supply gets cut off and um, it, it, it dies. So epiploic foramen incarceration, this epiploic foramen is, is a little hole just near the liver, between the liver and the stomach. And also um, uh, uh, beside the, the, the large vein carrying the main blood supply back from the abdomen to the heart. Okay, um, so pop onto the next slide. Um, so I think this is showing actually the difficulties of pulling the intestine out. So uh, you can see on the left, I, I'm, I'm pulling with one hand, uh, but then in the next slide, I'm pulling with two hands. Um, and this intestine is unfortunately very, very badly stuck. And then I do manage to get it out and you can see it is at this stage it's much more severely discolored it's very red very congested and unfortunately that intestine has been died no has died you know and that, that intestine will die within that forum and within a matter of hours okay um so uh, just pass on to the next slide so and i think oh, oh no just go back to that one go back to that one go back first um, there we go. So, so on the, if we look at the bottom right there, then then um, there was also a big hole in the in the mesentery as well. And and this this unfortunate mare, she had um, you know a quite a large amount of the small intestine had gone through the hole, maybe over twenty feet, um, and it was too dead. And then also she did suffer a bleed as well. So she didn't make it. That patient died. That horse died, and that, and that was before this. Um, so then there was Liverpool University did a study. So we'll just go to the next slide. And so what they did in this study, so this study was written up by Professor Deborah Archer in 2008. And, and they got 109 cases of epiploic foramen incarceration. And um, some Irish uh, centres contributed to this study. Uh, um, Troytown Hospital did, and I think some of the others may have as well. Um, but it was really interesting. What they looked at, they looked at the 109 horses that developed the the small intestinal entrapment, and they compared them to 310 other horses which had either another type of colic or had no colic whatsoever. And the really interesting thing was that they, they, they looked and asked lots of questions to find out what we would call risk factors. Um, you know, a factor that made a horse more likely to suffer from this internal incarceration, this internal herniation, what we call an epiploic foramen entrapment. And the biggest factor was actually performing oral stereotypies. So if a horse performed crib biting or wind sucking behavior, then it was 67 times more likely to suffer from an epiploic foramen um, entrapment a than a statistic. horse that didn't. Mm. Yeah, that is a massive, massive risk factor. And so, and so again, that, that, that should change our attitudes towards dealing with crib biting and wind sucking because the bottom line is horses that are crib biters and wind suckers are more likely to suffer from this fairly severe type of colic, which has a relatively high death rate because of the fact that it traps in there and that the intestine dies so quickly. Um, and, you know, we don't, we don't have a biological, a full biological understanding of that, Wendy. So we don't know why horses that, you know, do these oral stereotypies are more likely to, uh, to, to suffer from this type of colic. But I think my take home message from this is that if you do have a horse 
that is suffering from an oral stereotypy, that you do take it seriously and that you do look into its behavior uh, really carefully. What is causing the stress? You know, turn the horse out, give the company, give the horse the best company it can possibly have um, as well to try and relieve the stress so that the, 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 the behavior doesn't become ingrained. Because once the behavior becomes ingrained, and we think that the, the ingrained behavior takes maybe six or 12 months to happen, Wendy. Um, so if we can prevent that from becoming ingrained, then we're doing the horse a big favor. Um, and again, this study also showed the increasing size of the horse. So the bigger the horse, the more likely they were to suffer from this. Um, and then the other interesting thing, the history of a previous colic. So if a horse had had another colic a previous time in the previous 12 months, it was four times likely to suffer this. So, um, uh, so, so those, those were interesting. Again, we can't fully explain them. There was a slight increased risk, 2.2 times more likely, if the horse carer was not actually the owner of the horse. So if it was a non-owner, a relative or spouse, and we, we don't know why that was. Okay, and then some behaviors actually reduce the risk of this type of colic. So a horse that was, you know, a show was easily frightened or sweated up easily or was inquisitive or went off the feed when stressed, um, they actually had a reduced risk, a reduced likelihood of suffering from this type of colic. So lots of these studies are ongoing at the moment. Um, and have been doing uh, sort of like to show us what we call risk factors and give us an idea of what is causing some of these more serious types of colic as well, Wendy. This certainly says as well too, to those who are, you know, maybe looking for a horse or a pony to purchase, like to be, I suppose, cautious about investing in those that are exhibiting stereotypies, you know? Absolutely, Wendy. I mean, certainly if, if if I uh, uh, see that in a in the history, then I will I will point it out to the people who are going to buy the horse and say, you know, we we used to think that they were you know totally benign, but you know there's now good scientific evidence that they're they're not absolutely benign. You know, um, we have a ton of questions coming in, so we'll, right. we'll try and do another little piece, and and then we'll we'll give a couple of minutes to try and go through some of those questions, so, and um, we might have to follow so, up with some people afterwards. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, let's do this slide then and we'll go on to the next. So yeah. what, what risk factors, um, you know, so just a horse being in a veterinary hospital is a risk factor and will increase the, the, the you know, the risk of colic. Um, so again, that's probably because of stress, maybe changes in diet and things like that. Undergoing general anaesthetic. I'm a surgeon. Okay, so most of my patients are, are, are having general anaesthesias. We do do a lot of standing surgeries now, and that's great. But it's, it's suggested that one in 12 horses that has a general anaesthetic might experience colic, you know, associated with the time of that as well. So again, you know, stress factors, we, we don't know precisely why, but these have been noted in studies. You know, breeds, one of the things that's interesting, and this might interest uh, uh, is that some people say, oh, well, thoroughbreds are much more likely to get colic uh, than other types of horses. Well, um, I, I don't think that's been shown to be true in the, when we look at the science properly. And the next slide is going to talk about feeding um, as well. But overall, no breed is at greater risk of having colic. Um, some studies used to say, oh, well, you know, Arabian horses had more colic than others. But when, when the other, other bigger studies have been done, they've shown these things not to be true. So our Irish sport horses and our, our thoroughbreds are not at an increased risk of colic just associated with their breed themselves. Uh, weather patterns, there's a lot of conflicting evidence really. I mean, the main problem with weather patterns is, is lush grass growth. So lush grass growth in the spring will produce the, a colic that's on the bottom slide on the bottom right, a sort of like a colon torsion in the large brood mares. And that's, that's a well-known risk factor. Flick onto the next slide, Wendy, because then we're just gonna, um, so, I did see, so again, talking about the risk factors, so history of previous colic, change in diet we've talked about i've mentioned before about you know increasing gait grazing time as a protective factor we talked about impactions and and sort of like being removed from the paddock and confined to the stable as a risk factor in getting that very common cause of colic um, but there is a lot of conflicting information about parasite control and the frequency of deworming some studies have shown actually wendy that you know when you ask people about colic um the horse of colic and they 
they, if they get asked about um, uh, whether they have worn the horse or not, they'll automatically say, oh, yes, no, I've worn the horse as well, because they won't want to feel guilty. That, so, you know, some, some, some early studies uh, didn't control for these kind of things and weren't very sophisticated. And they actually showed that in, there was an increased risk of colic associated with recent wormings, which was uh, fortunately scientifically debunked. But you can see that sometimes it's, you know, these have to be clever studies with statistics to be able to understand these things fully. Just pop to the next slide because I wanted the feeding factors. Oh, so then we'll, we'll flick through this because it's about California. Stones in California, we'll flick through that. Uh, yeah, flick through that. Go on. We'll we talked about that. But... And... Yeah, this, one, this is yeah. the one slide I want. So, so one of the important things, so a big study in America showed this about feeding, okay? Um, the more we feed concentrates to horses, then the more likely they are to suffer from colic, okay? So feeding two to five, uh, two and a half to five kilograms a day of concentrates increases the risk factor of, of having colic by a factor of nearly five. But when we go above five kilograms a day, it increases the factor um, by six, okay? So then, um, and, and that's why most of our sport horses, our high performance horses, um, our thoroughbred race horses, our show jumpers and our eventers, yes, they do suffer from more colic. But the reason is because they're being fed more, because they have to be fed for such performance. It is not that they are a and because it a weaker, a weaker breed, because that's what what a lot of people say to me and I have to I do have to debunk that myth a lot of the time because I, and I think some of the breeders would take it very personally as well whereas well it's really you know it's been shown in Ireland that no breed is at increased risk of colic it's what it's how we feed them it's it's the their level of performance um as well so um and, and there's as, the as we said on, before as well like you know ponies versus horses i mean ponies are, are probably more yeah. more likely to be in more natural management systems as well too exactly i mean certainly feeding uh, a pony I, I don't know i don't know of any ponies that get fed five kilograms of concentrates a day certainly none of mine do anyway wendy i don't know if anybody out there who but they possibly do but anyway look you know so so um it's a good point and 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 so ponies suffer from colic as well but they suffer less partly because of this feeding effect as well which is a big factor and again the grazing most po ponies are out grazing and and uh, this was the, this was the scientific risk factor that was fairly certain and you know that you know for each hour stable there was an increased risk of colic and obviously it reduces if you are out so if you're out 24 hours a day you're 27 times less likely to suffer uh, from a, a, an obstruction colic or a distension colic which are the common signs of colic you know than than, than other horses um we, so we might just um we might just talk a little bit about the parasite control maybe maybe just before i, I yeah open to the we got pop over to the questions um, Perfect. I'm looking through the questions there. Yeah. So go on, yeah, to parasites. Oh, yeah, do, you want to, do you want to pay mention to the, to the parasitic yep. so control? We, we mentioned tapeworms before, so I won't, I'm going to just reiterate it. that, but there were really questions to related to parasite control in, the, in the, the, so those that come in as well. A double dose um, in the spring and in the autumn. And, it's, and the problem for tapeworms is that our fecal worm egg counts don't actually recognize tapeworm infections a lot of the time. And yes, they are a definitive cause of colic um, and probably more related to colic than the roundworms because, you know, most of the roundworms, they do cause problems and in, in, in high amounts, they're definitely going to cause poor doing and, and, uh, and potentially enteritis. And we've seen a picture there of a, of a blockage in a young horse with ascarids, but um, in adult horses, it's it's less it's more complex, but tapeworms are a definite significant. So flick to the next one. We're having to quick open up a bit, aren't we? Yeah. Um, so so good worming is worming is obviously important. Um, and you know the new philosophy is that we should be uh, detecting the the. This is when we're talking about worming adults. Um, we should be detecting rather than just doing a calendar based thing uh, pattern where we we worm every horse every two or three months okay um, what we do is we should be trying to identify the horses with heavy worm burdens okay and um, treating those to try and reduce the worm burden 
on the, the pasture. And that, that is a very effective strategy. And there's good evidence showing that, you know, when that is done and has been done over many years, um, along in conjunction with other biological sort of controls, then, you know, as in good pasture rotation um, and things like that, then, then there's not an increase incidence of colic and i think that's what people would fear they would fear that if they go to um the, you know the biological uh, systems to try and prevent the resistance because the bottom line is we're getting a lot of resistance to our wormers and therefore our wormers are becoming less effective okay um so uh, so so identifying the adult horses which have got uh, the heavy worm burdens is is useful um, and again with the mares and foals i think uh, you know a late um i was speaking to my my, my colleague ursula Fogarty, and she you know it absolutely confirms that a a, a treatment for a um a brood mare when she is pregnant in the last uh, month or two of uh, gestation is a is a way of reducing the worm burden pre-folding okay uh, and that's fairly important Okay, should we look at some of these questions? Yeah, I'm skipping down through them because um, I'm just looking at what so you've kind of covered. Daniel and O'Sullivan, come, yeah. Daniel yeah, O'Sullivan, I think to, I've answered um, that question, yeah. There, which is asking about um, realistic transport duration and how can you make transportation as safe as possible in the case where you have to transfer to hospital? Um, so it's it's a good question. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, fortunately in Ireland um, now with the increased uh, you know numbers of hospitals that are, are doing colic surgery. You know, uh, you've Troy Town, you've Anglesey Lodge and Sycamore um, on, on the Curra, and then you've got Feathered Hospital down in the southeast, um, and you know the Veterinary College, um, and you know so so transportation. You know that that you know. I, I don't. I wouldn't put any absolute guidelines on it, but I'd be saying, you know, the the sooner you can make the decision, the better, as well, you know. Um, and you know, traveling with the, you know, giving painkillers and sedatives for the journey um, is is a good idea, and it never does any harm, as well, Wendy. You know, um, you know, is that is that answering the question enough? Yeah, I think that's okay. Um, there's a question here. Can lush fresh grass cause colic? For example, if a horse breaks into a silent field or a field of aftergrass? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So we talked about lush grass there, and that is a risk factor for producing um, a, a colon torsion. So particularly in brood mares, uh, one to two months or any time really um, after falling. Okay, so you've got to be, you know, you've got to be careful. So, um, uh, so that is is important. And again, a fresh growth of gross, a fresh growth of lush grass is going to change the, the 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 microbiota within the intestine, and potentially sort of like a change could stimulate a colic. So you've got to be a bit careful, you know. Mm -hmm. um, um, okay. um, there's another here. Is there a probiotic you would recommend to support the gut bacteria, for example, after antibiotics? It, it's, it's a really good question. I, I, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding here, Wendy. Um, I, I don't know if um, I, I, I don't I don't know if probiotics are the absolute the answer. OK, so, um, you know, probiotics may be you know we use them a lot in the hospital when horses have have got enteritis and uh colitis and and things like that um but as a preventative i i i don't i have not seen any great studies yet where they they've used this to prevent colic and it really has been scientifically documented so i'm kind of very wary about recommending things like that and giving people false um you know false information that something like that would be would be would be absolutely you know good you know in that instance you know does feeding concentrates while in the paddock reduce the risk of colic uh, it's a good question um so being out in the paddock is a good thing um feeding concentrates the more you feed the more like the articolic so I, I think there are two risk factors which would play off against each other but the bottom line is there's no harm in doing it okay um and being out in the paddock is beneficial um and if you if you have to feed them for condition 
and performance, then you just have to do it and you just take that risk. Well, I, I forgot to say, um, split up the feed, okay? I was so actually just about them, to say that, yeah. yeah. You know, feed, feed them two or three times a day mm -hmm. is better than just the one big feed because then the colons and the, the, mm -hmm. the hind guts, which are the digestive parts of the intestines, are not getting a complete massive load. Uh, so separating the feed is good. Definitely shouldn't be feeding more than I think it's 400 grams to, to 100 kg oh, body okay. weight. That's a, uh, 2 kg to five, 500 kg. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of like about a handful, isn't it, Wendy? Yeah. Um, right. Okay, if, is it possible for a horse nev to never have colic in its entire lifetime? That's kind of yes, like yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, what were we saying there that um, four to ten horses, uh, four to ten cases per hundred horse years? So that means plenty of horses go through their entire life without any colic at all. Yes, absolutely. And because lots of those numbers would be taken out by some horses that seem to have a disproportionate high number of col uh, colics um, episodes. Maybe they have an adhesion that is so mild, it causes a bit of a problem and then, you know, but never causes them to, to require surgery, you know, something like that. Yeah. I think we'll probably only just take one or two more now and wrap up. How long after you ride can you feed and will it cause colic if you feed soon after? Yeah, well, that's a good question, actually. Um, and, and again, in the risk factors, in the scientifically documented risk factors, um, that has been, um, ha has never been shown to be a problem. Uh, so I think if you're sensible about it, so if you exercise and then you let them, you know, even just calm down 10, 20 minutes by the time you've untacked them um, and cleaned them off, I think you're probably relatively safe to feed then because certainly that, you know, has not uh, been shown in the studies to be a significant factor. And certainly in the horses that I operated on and had serious colics in, I, I don't think I, I really remember, you know, many horses where I, I, you know, the owners and myself were convinced that it was a large feed after exercise, which then precipitated a bad colic, you know? Uh, so I, I think that's, yeah, yeah uh, that's for me in you're, Highland. You're, you're doing I, mighty. You're doing yeah. mighty. I, 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 I give you this question then to finish out. Is there is there any research on whether colic is hereditary? Um, I, again, that that you know, um, no, it 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 shouldn't be considered a hereditary disease because again, if we look at our breeds, Wendy, I've tried to emphasise. You know, there's no particular breed in Ireland that suffers from a colic because of the breed that it is. It's the other risk factors. It's the feeding, it's the high performance, and it's the increased size, or it's the fact that they're a brood mare um, and they're producing foals, or they're a stallion. Um, but other than that, no, we, I don't know of any significant colic um, that is, is related to a particular breed that's relevant in this country. Okay. Yeah, super. Uh, um, this is definitely the last one now. Does feeding fiber in concentrates help with digestion? Yes. For certainly. example, using the sugar beet or using chaff or something like that. Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. I mean, from a fundamental principle point of view, fiber is so important. Yes, it, it does help. And certainly, you know, but again, the studies don't, because there's not enough people feeding that, that, that you know, it doesn't show it as a protective factor, but I'm sure it does no harm because fiber is good. So fiber is good. And it certainly is not a risk factor that has been scientifically documented. And I suppose at the end of the day, you know, the big thing is really to kind of do do everything that is within your power that you can do to try and help to minimize the, the situation where Warren is going to be in a position of seeing your horse on his tables. You know, I mean, that's that's the point at the end of the day of having these conversations um, is to, to try and avoid those scenarios happening. But, you know, as you say, I mean, you know, it. it sometimes it's just going to happen at the end of the day and you know that you'll have done all the things that you can do and it is still going to happen but you can minimize it at the same time 
And just to say as well, because there were quite a few questions around parasite control in there that we can't get to in absolute detail, but there was another webinar that was done a number of months ago with Ursula Fogarty, who you mentioned, Warren, and with Nikki Walsh. And for those who are interested, they can go back and refer to that. The recording is there on www.chagas.ie forward slash Let's Talk Equine. So um, I just want to say a huge thanks to you. Um, I want to say thanks also to our audience this evening um, who stayed with us and uh, for their participation and the inundation in questions this evening, which was great. Um, so yeah, is there any final comment that you would like to say, Warren, to wrap up this evening? Um, yeah, look, I hope I haven't scared people. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, Wendy. It's been a real pleasure. I hope people have picked up some snippets and I've been able to give a bit of science out there and, and allay some people's fears. Uh, there, was, there was one last question I'm just going to do. And uh, in your experience, can emotional stress cause colic? Um, then, uh, then, yeah, stress is an interesting thing. But again, stress, stress, you know, because it, it Certainly, in my experience, you know, stress—you know—stress has been a predisposing, fa predisposing factor for the colic. But again, in the scientific studies that have been looked at these things, that's not been a consistent thing that is statistically seen. So, so yeah, minimizing our stress, doing things properly, um, feeding properly, and being really careful, observant, um, uh, you know, uh, owners is the, the most useful thing. And and hopefully, you will, you'll 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 be colic free. May you stay colic. Uh -huh. Uh, I'll, ha are, I'll have to give the last comment here to Gary O'Shaughnessy who says if it does happen, Warren is the best man to sort your horse. So uh, that's clearly, very... he had, clearly he had a good outcome in, in, in whatever. That's very kind, I'd Gary. Say. Hello. So, <laughs> so look, at, we have gone 20 minutes over time, but the majority of the audience are still there and fair dues. That is a testament to the interest in what you've had to say. So thanks for that. Just a shout out to our next Let's Talk Equine on this, uh, Tuesday, December 7th, when I will be joined by none other than Dr. Noel Cawley and uh, Greg Broderick. So um, I'm looking forward to that chat and we'll be talking about their breeding and competition successes over the, the course of 2021. So I hope that, um, that some of the audience members here tonight will come back and join us then. Warren, huge thanks, lots of information shared. Our enemy is always the clock. <laughs> That's just, you know, but look, say yeah. we've, we've shared a lot and, and thanks so much to you. So um, in, 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 in usual Zoom fashion, I'll say good night and it is an adieu to all in the one foul soup at the bottom. So thanks and good night for now. Bye everybody.